Today, I'm going to explain the movie Paradise Road, released in the year 1997. At Raffles Hotel in Singapore, a group of soldiers is enjoying a dance with their partners. It is a great stress reliever for them since they've been fighting against Japan in World War II. We are introduced to an Australian nurse, Susan, who is dancing with a man she met at the party. Similarly, a woman in her 20s named Rosemary is with her soldier husband, who she is completely in love with. At a table nearby, a group of American men and women are discussing how the Japanese could never defeat Americans. Right then, a loud explosion is heard outside. A man stops the party and announces that the Japanese soldiers have barged in through the borders. They're heading towards the city and could attack any minute now. All women and children are requested to board a ship that will take them to a safer place, while all men are appointed to the front line. The partners quickly say their goodbyes to each other before the women frantically get on the ship. As the ship sails, the Australian nurses tend to the passengers' needs and socialize with them. Everyone on board is given life jackets to wear for a few hours to ensure their safety. The night passes smoothly, but in the morning, Japanese aircraft launch missiles at the ship. The passengers go into a frenzy, trying to save their lives. Many women and children die in the attack, while a handful of them jump into a lifeboat and sail to the nearest island. However, Rosemary, who was separated from her husband, the Australian nurse Susan, and an American lady, Adrian, are left behind in the water. They swim for an entire day and finally reach the shore on the island of Sumatra. After crossing a muddy jungle, they reach a path and make their way forward. By now, the women are exhausted, but they talk to each other to keep themselves motivated. The first person they see is a Japanese soldier riding a bicycle. He's followed by a queue of such soldiers who cycle past the women. Then, Captain Tanaka from the Japanese force gives them a lift to the nearest town. On their way, Adrian reminds them of the mistake his men made by attacking a ship full of women and children. Their act was against the Geneva Convention, but the captain announces that Japan never signed it. After the women are dropped in the town, a Japanese sergeant slaps Rosemary for no reason. He then drags them to a larger group of people. It turns out that the women and children who were saved in the lifeboat have also been brought to the island. Susan reunites with her nurse friends and is thankful they're safe. Following that, the soldiers forcefully take them to a prison camp that already holds prisoners from different backgrounds. They're given a shed to share between hundreds of women. The next morning, the prisoners are woken up by soldiers who treat them like cattle. The colonel announces that they're now the prisoners of the Japanese government and have to live according to their rules. A woman tries to cut him off but is beaten up by the sergeant. The soldiers forcefully make them bow down to the Japanese flag while their national anthem plays in the background. A while later, a truck provides the prisoners with leftover meat and vegetables that they cook and ration out to the 400 of them. While socializing, the women realize that they are of all nationalities, including Dutch, English, Irish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Australian. And they also come from many levels of society. There's a slight tension between some English and Dutch women, but everyone decides to live in harmony for as long as they're in the camp. Then, we're introduced to a Jewish woman named Verstock. She claims to be a doctor and is relatively close with the Japanese soldiers because of her expertise. When asked about where she's from, she mentions that she was not allowed to socialize with the higher class people like them when she was outside. Following breakfast, they're made to do field work all day long. They have to defecate in a bucket full of water and cannot rest if they're tired. One of their duties includes fetching water for the soldiers to bathe with. While they're at it, the soldiers walk around naked with no shame, which is surprising to the conservative women. One of them, who's been in the camp long enough, spreads rumors about a men's camp being on the other side of the mountain. While everyone dismisses it, Rosemary is intrigued because that would mean her husband might be on the other side. In only a few weeks, a pandemic of malaria spreads among the prisoners. While some of them die, others become bedridden. The oldest woman from the batch, Mrs. Roberts, also gets the disease. She had brought her puppy with her even after the mishap on the ship. It is her only support animal, but some women hope she dies so they can cook her pet. It goes to show that the most respectable of the society are also left slaves to their human instincts when at risk of dying. With more and more people getting sick, the shortage of medicine becomes a problem. Hence, they have to get quinine by trading their earrings with the soldiers. A Chinese woman named Wing takes on the job and sneaks outside at night. She manages to cross the fence and trade the medicine, but some guards are alerted while she's at it. At last, she returns to the shed without being caught. Mrs. Roberts is given the medicine, which helps her greatly. 
But then, Captain Tanaka gets a hint of what happened last night. He brings Wing to the front and burns her alive as punishment. The other prisoners are horrified at the sight. That evening, Adrian is humming a song when she's joined by an older woman named Daisy. They bond over their common love for music and decide to form a vocal orchestra among the women. They write musical notes on notebooks, which some women disapprove of, fearing the Japanese's wrath. But others are keen to join the orchestra. Mrs. Robert, who has now fully recovered, starts nagging about having to live with people from the lower class. Her daughter informs her that Wing died trying to save her life. After the revelation, Mrs. Robert feels guilty and is thankful for a kind soul like Wing. The following morning, Adrian and Daisy start the first orchestra practice that is interrupted by the soldiers almost immediately. They beat and pull the women for doing something they're not allowed to. But the ladies are in no mood to give up. They form a smaller group and practice in quiet places to go unnoticed by the soldiers. The plan works, and they're able to make some considerable progress. One day, the sergeant comes to the shed, shoving every woman on his way. He hands Daisy a list of names. After analyzing it a bit, they come to the conclusion that the women on the list are all young and beautiful. They're put in a vehicle and taken to a mansion occupied by the higher Japanese officials. A translator explains to them that they're being given an opportunity for a better life. If they agree to be the mistresses of the officials, they will be given silk sheets, good food, and their own rooms. While some of the women think the offer is outrageous, others assume it is promising. One of Susan's fellow nurses, Adrian's best friend Topsy, and some other women take the job. Many more months pass, but the war doesn't end. With passing time, many women die in the camp. Adrian manages to convince Susan and her friends to join her orchestra. One day, Susan enters Dr. Verstock's cabin and finds her hammering a gold tooth out of a dead body. She claims it's of no use to the owner and can be useful to the women later on. Initially, Susan thinks what the doctor is doing is wrong, but it turns out that Verstock trades gold with Japanese soldiers for medicine. She wants Susan to learn all the tactics so she can keep the prisoners alive in case the doctor is killed one day. That night, Adrian is outside the shed when a drunk soldier attacks her and tries to assault her. She defends herself efficiently and shoves him to a puddle. But then, the other soldiers arrive and blame her for hitting a soldier for no reason. She's kept inside a cage for the night so the convocation can be done the next day. The sun rises and she's taken in front of Captain Tanaka. The soldier has lied to him that he only touched her because she refused to bow to him. When Adrian tries to give her side of the story, the captain sees it as her insulting the Japanese soldiers. He shoves her to the ground and kicks her repeatedly. Somewhere else, the other women go to the colonel's office and vouch for Adrian. They beg him to be fair and let her go because it was the soldier's fault. Initially, he shows reluctance, but when they compare him to Captain Tanaka, he decides to help. That night, the orchestra performs its very first show, taking the Japanese soldiers by surprise. Even when the soldiers are ordered to stop them, they're so mesmerized by the music that they hardly can. By the end of it, even the leaders clap for the ladies. In the following scene, the prisoners are gathered and told that Japan has gained further success in the war, and now Australia wants to join hands with it. Susan huffs and whispers a profanity under her breath. However, Captain Tanaka seems to have heard it. He calls her to the front and asks her to repeat what she said. When she refuses to oblige, he makes the soldiers kneel down and trap her in such a way that if she moves, she will be stabbed to death. Susan stays there for hours in scorching heat and no water, but the soldiers do not allow anyone to help her. Twenty-four hours pass, and the captain returns at the same time the next day. Impressed with her will to live, he lets her free this time. By now, the ladies perform an orchestra every night for the colonel and the sergeant, who over time have become fans of their music. They even give them two bars of soap as a present. It has now been two years since the prisoners first arrived. They are transferred to a different and less facilitated place on the island, but aren't told the cause of it. While being transported, they notice a bunch of women having afternoon tea outside a mansion. They presume those were the girls who agreed to be the mistresses. To Rosemary's shock, she spots her husband among the prisoners that the Japanese have brought. This means only one thing, they are about to kill him. She cries her way to the new location, knowing that she will never meet the love of her life again. At the new location, they're made to stay at abandoned houses with no mattresses. Even the food resources are less, so the women have to resort to eating snakes and grasshoppers. Many people get sick because of malnutrition and eating raw meat. After seeing her husband with the Japanese, Rosemary no longer has the will to live. 
She starves herself for days and cries all night long. Eventually, she passes away, alongside Mrs. Roberts and tens of other prisoners. A field by the sheds has turned into a graveyard by the end of a few months. In the end, only a handful of those who came from the boat are left. They have almost forgotten what their life was like before they were captured, but they have also learned a great deal at the camp. Then, on the 24th of August, 1945, the colonel gathers everyone, gets on top of a table, and announces that the war has ended. He apologizes if he made any mistakes and promises that he did everything he could for the prisoners. The Japanese soldiers leave the post, letting the prisoners free to do anything. The women jump, dance, and erupt into cheers, celebrating their freedom. It is narrated that the survivors were rescued within two weeks and sent to Singapore. From there, they were sent to their respective homelands. The music in the film was created from the sheet music that the original orchestra made. Even after being freed, the survivors maintained their friendships until their deaths. That was all from the video. I hope you liked it. Subscribe for more content like this and hit the like button to help us out. Also, leave a comment if you want us to recap your favorite movie. Until next time, take care.